Giant, the epic film starring Rock Hudson, Elizabeth Taylor, and James Dean, celebrates its 40th anniversary this year. To commemorate the event, the film has been fully restored and will be released in New York and Los Angeles. It was the third and last movie made by the legendary James Dean, who died before the film's completion. It received 10 Academy Award nominations. Joining me now, George Stevens, Jr., the son of the film's Academy Award-winning director and one of the people responsible for its restoration. And a good friend, and I'm pleased to have him on the broadcast. Welcome. Certainly. Uh, one of the things that I, I... Your respect and love and admiration for your father um, is, is inspiring. I mean, in the documentary you made about him uh, and what it said and what it said about him. And now you have a chance to come back again in a sense, and reflect on, uh, on this really extraordinary film that came yeah. among many great films he made in the 50s. How did the restoration come about? You know, films are so fragile. Right. And I heard a terrible story two years ago, which turned out to be true, was that Paramount had lost or destroyed the negative to A Place in the Sun. Your dad's film. Yeah. yeah. You know, one of the great films of all time. So we are at work now restoring A Place in the Sun and Shane, the two Paramount pictures. Yeah. But with the 40th anniversary of Giant coming up, I thought first we should look and see what kind of shape this picture is in. And Bob Daly at Warner Brothers thought it was a real opportunity to bring Giant back into theaters for a new generation. And so we had to do a lot of work. The soundtrack, the three master soundtracks to Giant were lost. But we found a combined soundtrack of dialogue, music, and effects and with a wonderful mixer named Bob Litt out in Hollywood and all of this digital technology, we worked for... To separate them. Yeah, three weeks and make the music, bring it back and get noise out of the soundtracks. And the result is a soundtrack that is every bit as good in a couple of respects better because of the fidelity than the original. And with the picture, there was fading, but we went to Technicolor and they revived this color imbibition great printing process that stopped 25 years ago for economy reasons after The Godfather 2. And they're thinking of bringing it back and they made Giant the pilot project. So we may see the release of other great films now because you can bring them back and, and add to yeah. and I hope the quality. Another thing, I, I think that filmmakers, I, should, I know I will, I think we'll start asking to use this uh, color imbibition printing process which make, makes prints sharper, greater density of color um, and it's just a better experience for the audience. To hear this story reminds me of the fact that so many kinescopes of great television oh, yeah. programs were just lost or, or, or buried or forgotten yeah. and yeah. destroyed and thrown out in the garbage. I mean, there are people like, I think, some of Jack Parr's early shows and people like yeah. that. Why is it they have so little respect for their history? You know, I mean, people used to think, well, my father always had this idea. He was the first person I ever heard say, use the phrase, the test of time yeah. regarding pictures. We, I, yeah, defining moment for me was coming home from the 1952 Academy Awards. My father was driving the car. My mother and my grandmother were in the back seat. And between my father and me was an Oscar. And I was 17 years old. I was excited. And I think he thought I was a little too excited because he, he looked over at me and he smiled and he said, you know, he said, we'll have a better idea what kind of a film this is in about 25 years. And it was the first time I had a sense that movies weren't just for the year they came out in, but, you know, if they're well made, they're there for generations. They're like good books. You can go back to them exactly. and go back to them and go back to them. Tell me about the making of Giant. I mean, it was the great last film of James Dean, who yes. became a legend and even put on a stamp and, and is a sort of heroic character for mm -hmm. so many young people because of his attitude, I think, as much as anything. Um, Rock Hudson, the most beautiful woman of her time, um, Elizabeth Taylor. Yeah. How did it come about? What was your dad thinking about doing? You know, I've been thinking about it because we're doing a 40-page booklet or 80-page booklet on Giant that will come out with the video. Um, you know, it was a t he, he had aspiration for his films, and I'm not sure there's that much of that around anymore, but he believed in the story, Edna Ferber's novel, and he spent three and a half years making Giant. He took no salary. He had a self-confidence that he thought he could make this into a film 
that would appeal to audiences. And by the kind of deal he made, he had complete control over the making of the picture. So what started out to be a two and a half hour picture became a three hour and 20 minute picture, a great epic. Um, it became the most successful picture in Warner Brothers history and remained that up until the 70s when, Super, when Superman came out. Yeah. But he had self-confidence and he took this cast. Usually when you make a film that's historical, you pick people who are somewhere in the middle age range and then age them down and age them up. But he took 23-year-old Elizabeth Taylor, 23-year-old James Dean, and 28-year-old Rock Hudson. And that was the age they were at the beginning of their parts and had the confidence to let them play the older roles. Yeah. What was it about the story that he liked? The well, the, character, the characters are wonderful. Yeah. And he had some themes that interested him. Um, the racial aspect, you know, that with the Mexicans, right. Mexican-Americans in Texas, which is a very important theme of the story. Elizabeth Taylor plays an independent woman far before you know, the 60s and feminism and a, and a consciousness raising about that. And it's a story of family. You know, we, we ran the film the other night, you know, this, uh, and, and the audience, there's so much laughter, there's so much kind of humanity. But it's also about power and mm -hmm. ambition yeah. and risk, yeah. you know, and believing in your dreams yeah. and squandering it all. Mm -hmm. I mean, all those things, those powerful emotions, you know, that we've all sort of find our best work dealing with. Mm -hmm. you know, others include jealousy and betrayal and, yeah. you know, and competition, but it has all of that stuff in there. It's about the human condition. Yeah. Take a look at this. This is where, set this up, this is where Jet tells Jordan and Leslie that... Yes, this sort of young maverick, poor boy, on the big Benedict ranch, which yeah. the Rock Hudson character owns and runs, uh, finally gets a little piece of land and the, thinks he might find oil at the, out of the ground. And he does. Roll tape. Here it is from Giant. I'm rich, baby. <laughs> I'm a rich. I'm a rich boy. Me, I'm going to have more money than you ever thought you could have. You and all the rest, you stinking sons of Benedicts. Leslie, you go out in the house. Take the women with you. <laughs> Jet, we're real glad you struck him. Now you go on along home. Oh, my, you sure do look pretty, Miss Leslie. You always did look pretty. Just pretty now, good enough to eat. Tessie, Vic. Tessie is an old cook. You should have shot that fellow a long time ago. Now he's too rich to kill. Never have gotten that line in. Too good to eat, or yeah, yeah, yeah. you wouldn't thought. How did your dad get that line in? I, you know, I, I, I never thought about it until uh, until I saw the picture recently. Yeah. When the film was made, were you there? Yes, I worked with my father. I just got out of college. And I worked with my father on the script uh, with he and the writers. I went in the Air Force for two years. Would visit the company in Charlottesville and in Marfa, Texas, and at the studio in Burbank. And I managed to do my two years in the Air Force and still be able to work on the sound and the editing. It didn't win the Academy Award right. for Best Picture. What was uh, it, 80 days? What, around the world in 80, 80 days. days. Yeah. I mean, was your dad? He, I remember him telling me, and it's been a philosophy of mine, he said, those awards, he said, if they come your way, enjoy he them. He won the Best Director, but the film not winning Best yeah. Picture. If they come your way, he said, enjoy them, but never think about the ones you don't win. Yeah. Was there a sense that it was a great film when they were doing it, that this was a film that would stand the test of time? Or I think so. I mean, it was a film of tremendous aspiration and uh, a lot of talented people working on it. And I think, I think it was, yeah. 
And when it came out, I just, you know, I was just re seeing some of the reviews. You know, they were just so wonderful. It was wonderfully respected. Was there a sense that even then that, that um, James Dean had it? I mean, because he only made, what, not many films. He had talent? Yeah. I mean, that he had something special. That oh, yeah. he was going to be great. Yes. I mean, I, you know, you spent some time with right. him, and he was right. just tremendously gifted and imaginative and had a, you know, a kind of visceral uh, talent that came across on the screen. A lot of people say, and Larry McMurtry wrote a piece that's in this weekend's New York Times, uh, the cultural section, saying that Texans loved the film, yeah. even though it wasn't necessarily flattering of Texans. Yes. You know, it took hold somehow as, as special for them. You know, I think, I think though, it, it, there was something, you know, some of it was sort of satirical or treated their problems, the, the race question in particular. Um, and it, it was done with a, a kind of humanity and respect. You know, it was not a cheap shot in any sense. It was true. What happens next? I mean, you think that the other people will step forward and try to take and restore these films like this and go find them? I and mean, you found Place in the Sun before it was finally sort of mm -hmm. decimated. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think mean, that everybody that has, I mean, it would seem to me that, that everybody who has any claim to a great film because of what you've done here mm -hmm. is going to go say, you know, where is... I hope that's one of the results, because I am finding, as I work on my father's films, that yeah. films I've made much more recently are in danger. And I hope part of this films is... Films that you've made are in danger. Yes. I mean, you know, unless certain protection elements are done, I mean, separate but equal that we did yeah. several years ago, uh, the color will eventually fade, and there's a process by which you can protect that. And I really hope, and I am saying to people, I think filmmakers really have to pay attention and watch out for their own films because they really can't depend on anyone else. And if restoration work needs to be done, it really has to be done by someone who knows the film. Otherwise, the sound can change, the yeah. color can change. Speaking of the sound, now who scored this? Dimitri Tiomkin. And he viewed it, I read somewhere, as, as if he was scoring a great epic, a classic film, almost mm -hmm. if he was doing something akin to Tolstoy rather than Edna Ferber. Well, perhaps. I mean, since Dmitri was from Tolstoy's country, yeah. um, he was Russian. He was Russian. It was a wonderful story. To get an Academy Award, you know, the song from a picture has to be sung in yeah. the picture. And my that. father didn't want songs sung in this picture, but Dmitri had written, and Paul Francis Webster, a colleague of his, had written lyrics for the main title, This yeah. Then is Texas, giant state of Texas, Austin and Houston and Alamo. And Dad said, Dimitri, if we sing that over the main title, people won't have anything to do for the next three hours because you've told them the whole story. And Dimitri says, oh, George, he says, I'm just schmuck musician. You're a great director, he says. And he kept trying to do it. And we came back from lunch one day, and there's a man sitting in the outer office who we don't recognize with Tiomkin. And uh, we didn't recognize him because he normally wore a toupee, and he didn't have it on that day. And Dimitri says, George, he says, this is Frankie Lane, greatest singer in America. And he takes him in to the piano, and Dimitri sits down, and poor Frankie Lane has to sing this song, trying to sell it yeah. to death to, to put in the film. And what happened? It didn't go in the film. Didn't yeah, no. Yeah. He just said no. Yeah. It doesn't fit. Yeah. Yeah. It will be released in New York and in Los Angeles first. Yes, and then uh, 50 other cities across the country. Good luck. Thank you, Charlie. George, great to have you here. George Stevens, Jr., the restoration of Giants seen around the country in the upcoming weeks.